The chair of the third person will be Dr. Deep Kumar, Shahid Captain Vikram, Batra Government College, Palampur, Imarsal Pradesh, India. So, yeah, ma'am, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Sir, shall we start with the presentation, sir? Yes, please. Now, we would like to welcome Abhishek Trahim, PhD Research Scholar, Department of English and Cultural Studies, Punjab University, Chandigarh, India, to present his paper on the topic of Present Past, the Politics of Memory in Adult Glissons, the Overseas Cabin. All right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, ma'am. Uh, I am Abhishek Trehan, PhD Research Scholar, Punjab University's English uh, Department. The title of my paper is Present Past, the Politics of Memory in Edward Glissant's The Overseer's Cabin. The historic knowledge that the past possesses is now being conceived as a catalog of reimagined association and interplay between a pluralistic history and multifaceted undertaking of memory. This transition is symbolic of a continuous significance of memory in arguing that history alone does not have any particular claim to truth. Reading Edward Glissant's The Overseer's Cabin, the paper will examine the entwining complexities of the past as accentuated by hegemonic manipulation of memory that invariably represents a constant struggle over the meaning of history and how it pursues the trajectory of socio-political crisis. By reading the altered histories against the politics of memory, I delineate the characterization of the remembrances to recover collective silences that are crucial to historicize the construction of the past. In the overseer's cabin, Glissant's interest in historizing the Martinican past is more than simply nostalgic and definitely does not concede to the notion of idealization of cultural practice. Vishek, you are not audible. If somebody has Abhishek's number, he may kindly be contacted, but he is not audible. Um, I think Mr. Abhishek has left to meet. Uh, we can uh, go on with the next person so that if he can join later, we can go on with Abhishek, sir. Yeah, next participant is uh, Anavesha Gogoi. I think uh, she isn't present in the meeting. Is she? Um, uh, no, sir. She's Anavesha. not present there. The third okay, person? Now, th third paper presenter is uh, Mr. Uh, yeah. Saurabh Kumar it's, I think it's Saurabh Kumar Chaudhary. Yes, yes ma'am. Mr. Saurabh Kumar, are you ready with the presentation? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I am going yes, to repeat the presentation. Yes, sir. Please, thank you. Go on with the presentation. 
Okay, good afternoon, one and all. Thank you for the generous introduction. My name is Saurabh Kumar Chaudhary, and I am currently research scholar in the Department of English, Central University of Rajasthan. So I am going to present my presentation through the PPT. So uh, kindly give me permission to present my PPT. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Sir, is my PPT visible to you? Yeah, 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 visible. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Sir, the title of my presentation is "The Silver Lining in Disability Studies: A Reading of Priti Monga's The Other Senses." And uh, with this, uh, the next slide is uh, "Disability Studies Introduction." The first point: traditional notion of disability. In in the era of post-colonial and subaltern discourses, abundant discussion on race, caste, gender, and sexuality as the defining vectors of identity construction has been good then. However, the concept of otherness in respect to disability is a newly emerging discourse. Disability or impairment is always considered as the lack or deficit in the able-bodied society. So the conventional societal norms often deny the existence of equal rights for disabled alongside the normate. as philosophers like nusbaum presupposes a certain kind of capability that effectively bars seriously disabled individuals from full membership and participation in the relevant communities and coming to the next point emergence of disability studies in various domains sir initially disability has been considered in the area of medical sciences and was framed as the concept of medical uh, concept of physical impairment later it began to be studied in the sociological and psychological domain with focus on inclusion and exclusion of people in the society identity politics suffering of daily life gendered notion of disability in different movements and the framing of the policies in the growing sequences of human rights and identity politics the field of disability studies emerges as an interdisciplinary discourse where the voices were raised on the questions of justice equality right etc and to the next point feminism and women disability philosophers disability philosophers like nancy j harchman brings for the limited approach of feminist and believes that feminist disability studies yani fds implements theory and practice of intersectionality in a more effective way than feminist studies do it highlights the concept of intersections not only as differences rather as combinations we often use theory of intersectionality to analyze differences in feminist studies but feminist disability studies represents the connections of the various different positions mutually producing new experiences and to the next point intersectionality of women and disability Hartman also argues that although both feminist and disability theory share a deep concern about the body and the bodily differences yet there is a tacit assumptions of body and these standards to lead to the exclusion of disability from the feminist agenda of equality no literary or sociological movement provided a platform to the women with disability their voices were snubbed under the prominent agenda so the newer critical approaches like intersectionality becomes a better analytical tool to analyze and find solution to the women and disability at the intersection of gender and disability and to the next slide that is disability studies in india the first point is stereotypes about disability in indian society so indian in indian context disability is often associated with karma and the punishment of sins committed in the previous births such a construction by society on the one hand marginalizes the disabled population and on the other hand the internalization of such thoughts by the disabled themselves furthers the agenda of disempowerment the culture of charity pity and wealth uh, welfare is more promoted in india than providing the disabled with their rights and empowering them however the significant policy decisions were introduced in the change in internal national forum when the united nations declared 1981 as the international year of disabled persons and the next point celebrating differences uh, disability studies in indian academic research and the literary text now disability studies is gaining a dominant presence in the indian research and pedagogical system through indian writings people have started to identify classify and qualify literary texts having essence of value with the perspective of disability studies in the domain of sociology and psychology the discourse of disability uh, discourse of disability is gaining attention with the agenda of marginalization and identity politics and literature further adds a new dimension to the field the intersectionality of disciplines enables the reader or critic to deal with the literary text with disability perspective 
however a laudable shift in the literary writings about disabled people is observed now they have started to narrate their experiences in different forms of art and the last point some are, there are some prominent thinkers also like nancy j harchman uh, rosemary garland thompson and in india uh, initially there were anita, uh, there, there was anita ghai and now there are more prominent thinkers like jgb prasad someshwar sati and many more are like this and the next slide is invisibility of disabled women so first point would be gender notion of disability studies through various movements in india in uh, so disability studies in india counters many identity politics and marginal positions there are various movements which raise the concern for one aspect of marginalization but at the same time lift other aspects of it movements like feminism excluded the concerns of dalit women disabled women economically backward etc and in the mainstream agenda disability studies too left to the concern of disabled, disabled women at their core so there is a critical point whether indian feminism is inclusive or sensitive or it ignores the other streams of gendered notion in disability studies also there is a gap about the concern for disabled women as there is a fair number of researches have done or going on in the different domain of the discourse but there seems a visible lack in the area of women disability and then the next point is acknowledgement of women disability and framing of legal policies worldwide the invisibility of disabled women in the discussion on disability was quite apparent until the Beijing declaration in 1995 the beijing document platform for action specified women with disability as a vulnerable group with little access to information on their rights the united nation conventions on the rights of person with disability passed by the general assembly in 2006 incorporates a separate article on women with disabilities and the next point is impact of disability on the fate of a woman as uh, disabled and disability theorist rosemary garland thompson explicitly brings forth the impact of disability on the fate of a women uh, quote in a society in which appearance is the primary index of value for women and increasingly for men beautification practices normalize the female body and disability even normalizes it feminization prompts the gaze disability prompts the stare feminization increases a woman's cultural capital disability reduces it quote unquote and the next point is a sex a sex uh, a sexual objectification of disabled women the men with disability and women with disability both experience marginalization the form of oppression experienced by women with disability need to be refracted through the prism of gender denotion as gai said the issues of access to public spaces and the asexual objectification of disabled women become essential in the understanding the identity construction of a disabled disabled woman and uh, the next slide is saying no to stigmatized existence the first point is priti monga's celebration of disability as her bodily differences disability as an identity category says harchman truly embraces difference in a way that feminism could learn from priti monga celebrates this difference and her entire life in the example of to be emulated she does not let her losing vision become an imped impediment or nor was happy with the sympathy of the people around her and the impact of social construction of disability the attitude of the people make her think if something is wrong with this wrong with her this confirms what hertzman talks about disability not being the bodily difference but rather the social con context in which they exist disability is indeed a social construction it refers exclusively to what a society social conditions prejudices biases and the built environment have produced and to the next point her defining uh, spirits of social stigmatization however priti monga defies all such labelings detests such pitying attitude and like a phoenix rises to contest her representation in society in a society that considers disabled women to be incapable of performing the roles of wives and mothers she enters into relationship with the men of her choice walks out of them and on her terms becomes becomes a mother of two children looks after them and the household chores independently takes up the jobs in various organizations and eventually becomes an entrepreneur in every aspect she challenges the stereotyped notion of the society about a disabled woman who are considered unfit for the roles of able bodied women so this shows the silver lining in the priti monga's life and the next slide is dream it do it and the first point is her entry into the world of disabled from able bodied to being disabled 
initially she was a normal child but lost her vision in her childhood causing a change chain of tormenting events her, her life and the doubts of teacher over her competence in her reading written activities created a future fear to her for the first time regarding her disability these doubts or sympathy can be interpreted as the fear of the able bodied of becoming disabled at any moment of life as severs puts it disability is the other other that helps make otherness imaginable in no other sphere of existence do people risk waking up one morning having become the persons whom they hated day before and the next point is her insistence to learn uh, and uh, support of the her next point is support from the family her gradual slipping towards disability was a frightening moment for the family their concerns over her future becomes the indian society no doubt is biased intolerant unjust towards disabled and situation worsen in case of women with disability besides priti priti for her indomitable courage her family equally deserves to be appreciated for standing by her in all the thick and thin of life struggle they were always supportive of her in the issues regarding education marriage career etc and the next point is her insistence to learn to cope up with able bodied people refusal to learn braille she continued with her schooling somehow but her reading with uh, receding vision resulted in a complete break from formal education after class 8 the family explored the alternative of blind school but due to the poor schooling system they refused to send her the her dream of being an educated person was ruined her fighting spirit always kept the silver lining for future it is because of her belief that disability is not something lack or deviance in her but it is just a difference from the other that kept her accepting the challenges of life and she sailed through the turbulent waters and the last point is her struggle in marriage on uh, uh, that is reflecting on the conventional notion of indian families on girls marriage priti has a beautiful heart and fighting spirit but no but not to forget that she is a human being and a woman desirous of a life partner she had a very clear picture of the men she should she would marry and her refusal to many proposals and also her denial to uh, continue her abusive marriage with uh, Uh, with her kith is an expression of resistance to the society that groups disabled women into a form of desexualized subjectivity see and basically talks of what harlan han means by a sexual objectification of disabled women while the feminist discourse abounds in the discussion over sexual objectification of women the disabled women's femininity is completely ignored there has been a conspiracy of silence about the sexuality of disabled women as gai said Monga's unsuccessful love affairs and several matrimonial offers, and eventually her abusive marriage to Keith, quite evidently bring out the cultural tendency to erase the sexuality of disabled women. And the last slide, and the last slide is conclusion. The first point is contrasting picture of patriarchy uh, in Preeti's life. Reflecting on the and talking about the role of patriarchy in Preeti Monga's life, we see two contrasting pictures. On the one side was the unconditional love and support from her family, on the other side was disappointment from her abusive first husband Keith, while her father and brother, and also her uncle, always stood by her. Her married life with Keith and some people at workplace created adverse situation for her. However, all these made her a strong person. And the next point is her courage to survive and willpower to go ahead with various tough decisions. Though her marriage to Keith was her own choice, she could courageously survive in the abusive marriage with the support of her family. Despite her numerous attempts, the marriage could not succeed, and she decides to walk out of it. Preeti displays unwavering strength as a divorcee and as a single mother to her her two children. And eventually, when she found Ashwini, she decided to get married to him, irrespective of the age difference. As she writes, "What will what will people think or say? Never bothers me." So, and the next point is. uh her fighting spirit to challenge the established norms and prove herself society always thinks thinks being a disabled means to seek help sympathy etc from the normate and moreover being a disabled woman means only to be dependent on others and also be desexualized priti had challenged the social norms as well as herself to go against the traditional conventions as she writes quote i was no poor little thing and i would not allow any situation to evoke that feeling in any one she has many dreams since her childhood though many of them quest due to her disability but she relentlessly tried to do something new in other fields as well she tried at uh, her hands at needle work knitting even learned to swim and dancing her confidence in herself boosted when she embarked the 17 hour journey from kolkata to 
Delhi alone. And the last point is her entry into her entry into entrepreneurship to relentless activism for the rights of people with special needs. She started learning music in her early adulthood, and after getting disappointed, she again managed herself and tried to do many different work, and finally succeeds in becoming the aerobic instructor. Later, also a successful entrepreneur. Unlike expected from the narratives created by the society, Preeti neither craves for sympathy nor does she complain about anything. Instead, she closes her memoir expressing her contentment and happiness with life. So now, in present, Preeti Monga is a trauma counselor, corporate trainer, aerobic tra uh, aerobics trainer, public speaker, and the director of Silver Lining Human Resource Solution Private Limited. Besides other accolades, she has to her credit being the first Indian visually impaired person to successfully clear the aerobic instructor training. Her life as narrated in the autobiography, The Other Senses, exemplifies her dream it, do it workshop. Thank you so much. And that's from my side. Saurabh, you have crafted your paper well. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any question from the participants or the dignitaries present in the conference? Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I said, uh, is there any question from the participants or the dignitaries present in the conference regarding this paper? If you want to clarify the things from uh, Mr. Saurabh. For actually, Hello. there was a reference in your paper where yes. you said, you said the disability is associated with karma. Yes. Would you explain it? How? Sir, I am I have mentioned that in Indian society it is it is the stereotypes that have made disability is uh, often disability is associated with karma and the scene of the previous slides how people have uh, did worst work so they have uh, they are punished with the disability in present life as stereotypes are going in the society so I have mentioned it. What is your opinion? What do you think? I said I don't think it's like so and I think sir in, in one line I can say disability is only the difference big people the if the if we focus on the title the other senses in normal able body society do the uh, able body society the structure are structured in a way that people uh, not, people able bodied people can do disabled people can do that things differently with their other senses so the normative society actually leveled with that disability or the lack of the body. So I don't think that is the punishment of the karma or uh, scene of the previous lives. Isn't a disability an exceptional ab ability? Sir, uh, actually, uh, this is also there is an also area that is uh, it is going on into the, the politics of language. If uh, you are uh, in it is in, a, in if it, it if it talks about in other terms uh, people are also also questioning the people uh, terms the Byangjan, even what the our prime uh, pm has uh, uh, said that so these all are the uh, politics of language what are the terms uh, we are using for the disability but i think disability is only the differences and people should uh, accept it as the only differences and uh, with uh, normal be, uh, be, uh, and treat normally with the other people as well. Good, good, great, commendable, commendable Saurabh. Uh, and uh, is there anybody who wants to ask any question from Saurabh? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, please, 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 go ahead. Uh, Saurabh Jain, uh, I just want to know uh, if you could please in the uh, um, the theoretical framework which you have used in your paper in a very you are not audible ma'am uh, i want you to are, know your sound is breaking ma'am can you hear me now can you hear me now yeah yeah you are now you can you please yeah yeah now you are audible can you please throw some light on the theoretical framework that you have used uh, in this particular paper and presentation, in in nutshell, uh, I mean something. Is there something like disability theory or what is your 
a basis what is your theoretical basis in nutshell for my clarification yes uh, first uh, if i talk about uh, uh, if we can move from feminism there is first wave feminism second wave feminism and the third wave feminism after third wave feminism there is feminisms and fe in feminisms there are many streams of uh, the uh, question of women so and there is, uh, so, uh, and this feminism there is black feminism post colonial feminism if we talk about post colonial feminism especially in indian context we often see the ki there are other uh, uh, indian feminism also excludes other concerns of the women because they also uh, indian feminism not uh, some of the anita gai has talked about, uh, some of the philosophers talked about feminist not exclude uh, not talks about the disability or disabled women because they fear of the uh, leveling of uh, dependency so from there if we talk about uh, and and the also there is theory of disability so theory of disability and the question of women at the intersection they form the uh, marginalization through marginalization double marginalization and there are other marginal positions as well so the intersection intersectional framework would be a better approach to uh, analyze all the uh, to analyze the women disability i think thank you sir for your great presentation and i wish a great future for you and Thank uh, you. Uh, next paper presenter is uh, t prathi uh, uh, t uh, pravitha devi research scholar from sri sarda college for women salem tamil nadu a very is she present here good afternoon sir very present good afternoon to everyone and i'm here to present my paper under the topic portrayal of cultural conflicts the scandalous secret uh, by uh, jai shri mishra while talking about the culturalism multicultural and intercultural interaction has become most common and gained a major importance uh, in human history uh, in uh, another another talk a migration takes place due to the various personal and professional motives uh, while in this paper i'm going to analyze the difficulties of migrants as well as self discovery of a woman while talking about the cultural context it has become the most common problem of a migrant people uh, in this uh, trans uh, we're talking about the transculturalism uh, the famous south american scholar fernando ortiz uh, 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 speak about the transculturalism is defined as seeing oneself in other excuse uh, me transcultural ma is in term yes i'm sorry to interrupt in the between ma'am yes. so, ma'am can you please yes. enable your video and present your paper i am in hospital so i can't able to uh, on the video sorry okay ma'am it's okay ma'am and i request saurav kumar uh, to mute your audio sir your audio is in on thank you sir thank you ma'am you can continue yes, ma'am thank you ma'am thank you thank you thank you thank you a transcultural is in turn described as extending through all human cultures or involving and in encompassing uh, combining elements of more than cultural uh, it it is like uh, the cultural identity plays the a major role in every uh, uh, migrating people's life cultural identity uh, may be defined by the social network of a people imitating and following the social norms as projected rather than representing an individual's interaction with a certain group we are talking about the cultural differences it it that does not uh, takes place when people migrate and interact with new culture only it happens when people have different perception on uh, a similar matters uh, we're talking about uh, jai shri mishra her novel scandalous secret portrays the pressure and mental conflict faced by the protagonist the protagonist named uh, neha uh, while talking about the protagonist uh, Well, for her education purpose, Neha migrates for London for education. Uh, in in this novel, the protagonist uh, concentrated on mainly uh, in his education wise, uh, and uh, dropped uh, out from the Oxford uh, University, and uh, he lead a happy life after getting married with a person named Sharad. As as everybody know, London is a centre part where all sort of growth in education and other areas are evident because the reputed Oxford. Uh, being located there 
may have migrated to London is for only the education purpose. And she had a dream and ambition uh, to graduate from Oxford University. In return to India without completing the course, the reason that she was not uh, treated as well by her classmates in Oxford. The betrayal of her professor, she became pregnant before a marriage and she could not reveal uh, about these kind of illiterate uh, happenings before marriage. The situation worsened because of the cultural differences between the professor and the Neha. Her inability uh, in understanding the intention of uh, the professor is because of the uh, difference in cultural practice. All this make her to drop education and to, and to stay at her friend's place till the delivery. After the delivery, uh, her thought is to uh, uh, make her children to be admitted in the orphanages uh, because of her fear about the future and identity in the society. Uh, she had a fear uh, because of the society uh, in this novel. Neha journey to India is with hope to get rid of the turbulence she faced in London. The event that happens after her return from the London makes herself and her parents to forget about, uh, uh, forget about the Oxford. Neha is blessed to marry a lovable person like uh, a Sharath, who is very much understanding. Uh, uh, she lives with comfort and uh, where her parents feel proud and happy thinking about her marital life. But the secret about the trauma in England is hidden from her parents too. It is not only the family luxury that comforts her, it is the culture in India. That gives a sense of security. Uh, and she could relate herself with the community in India, but not the society, which is uh, alien in, the, in uh, London. While in, uh, in other side, while speaking about the uh, abandoned ch child, Sonia, she separated from her mother and she was uh, uh, adopted the uh, adopted uh, by Richard Shaw and Lara in uh, in some other place. She urges to find her biological mother. So uh, she feels that is the identity identity of her. Though she is well brought up, loved and treated like a princess by the adopted parents, she is always inquisitive to know about the or original origin. Sonia is mixed with a uh, look of Indian and foreign. Her looks add up to the crisis as she cannot be completely considered as a foreigner or as an Indian. Adoptive parents initially restricted Sonia in finding her birth mother because of the fear that they would lose their identity as a mother and father. Like uh, Sonia takes up the painful process of uh, self-discovery in search of her mother. Neha also uh, had a crisis in identity initially, but she feels be belonging to her, to her culture in India since she's able to exert the control over the environment. Sonia, though, has a lovable family and education in reputed university, uh, while uh, as well as the familiar culture and friend, she wants to find her true identity because of her inner self, which is inquisiting for her birth mother. Uh, while in the end, the novel stands for traditional and uh, uh, traditional and modernity. It's struck between the traditional and modernity while Neha uh, follows the tradi traditional and Sonia uh, character represents the modernity. At the end of the uh, uh, novel, um, Jayashree Mishra present the struggle and misery faced by the women in general. She further depicts the success and survival of the women characters over uh, overcoming uh, their struggles in this society. Thank you. The session is over. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for nice uh, presentation. Is Thank there anybody who wants to ask any question from the presenter? Ma'am, there was a reference uh, in your presentation. In that reference, I would like to ask you, is only migration responsible for cultural conflicts? No, so generally there was a cultural conflict even in uh, the same uh, place, but it is uh, uh, far high in uh, while the migration happens. They have cultural conflict, whether to follow their native culture or to follow the uh, uh, that uh, migrating culture. So they suffer. Okay. Is there anybody who wants to ask any question? 
Next paper presenter is uh, Anvesha Gogoi. Are you present in the conference? Anvesha Gogoi. And uh, Mr. Abhishek Trehan, research scholar from Punjab University, Chandigarh. Yes, sir, I'm here. Yeah. Yes, uh, can yes, I present it now, sir? Yeah, represent your paper, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, audible. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so, the title of my paper is Present Past The Politics of Memory in Edward Lesson's The Overseer's Cabin. The historical knowledge that the past possesses is now being conceived as a catalog of reimagined association and interplay between a pluralistic history and multifaceted undertaking of memory. This transition is symbolic of a continuous significance of memory in arguing that history alone does not have any particular claim to truth. Reading Edward Brisson's The Overseer's Cabin, the paper will examine the intertwining complexities of the past as accentuated by hegemonic manipulation of memory that invariably represents a constant struggle over the meaning of history and how it pursues the trajectory of socio-political crisis. By reading the altered history against the politics of memory, the paper delineates the characterization of the remembrance to recover collective silences that are crucial to historicize the construction of the past. In the overseas cabin, Glissant's interest in historicizing the Martinican past is more than simply nostalgic and definitely does not concede to the notion of idealization of cultural practices. As the novel progresses, it becomes clear that Glissant's premise rests upon the erasure of differences that are not in tune with the narratives of nation. By challenging the official history through tropes of memory, the novel forsakes a linear narration of the past by correcting and then expands upon an unofficial version. In Hope and Memory, Svetan Todorov points out the similarities between appropriation of the past and distinction between history and memory, as he writes that, quote unquote, in working with the past, construction of meaning has to follow the establishment of the facts. Facts once known have to be interpreted they have to be fitted together, strung out along the line of cause and effect, but the criteria by which we judge the writing of history are always different. Retrieval of the past is not only cumbersome, but a complex process as it is impossible to recover all of the past. And so in order to overcome this, memory has to be a selection. Only some features of an event are preserved and others are dropped and forgotten either straight away or little by little. By its nature, memory echoes the chosen fragment of the past and explores the impediments to recovering it. But this constitutes another problem that at times results in, quote unquote, a criticism of testimony that is a test of its veracity, a search for imposture or more fundamental deception. While the novel dedicates a significant space to the Martinican past, it contextualizes history through a combination of sources, testimony, familial genealogy, and origins of the past. For this reason, the novel transcends a sequential understanding of the events and narration by deliberately inducing a parallel sort of abstraction, quote unquote, in the consciousness of those who were obliged to function within its limits. This is so because the novel elucidates a reconstruction of the past by highlighting the tension between memory and history through its characters. The novel opens and closes with two excerpts from the newspaper dated September 4, 1978 and September 13, 1978, which includes eyewitnesses accounts that describe behavior of a supposedly mad woman named Misa and an inquiry into the conditions of psychiatric care on the island, respectively. The novel does not sum up the personal narrative of Misa fully as the reader has to rely on the familial, family histories of other characters to understand the past experiences of her. Born in 1928 and released from asylum in 78, she cannot shut out the past. Unlike others in the novel, she is able to retain the traces of the Martinican past that are long lost in the official versions of the island. This extends the ambit of our memories, malleability, and at the same time complicates the notion of remembering against the collective experiences of events 
within the historical narrative in the novel. What supports this predicament is her supposed madness that is repugnant to the majority of people. Yet the madness in the case of her assumes a symbolic significance that endeavors to localize the relation between the present and the process of remembrance. This is self-evident as she consequently can be seen as descending from a line of women who appear to embody the complexities, the anguish, and the kind of spiritual resistance which are all necessary to combat the reality of the present. The resonance of the past is created by memory and stored by history. Memory thus reflects absences, silences, by explicitly embracing the ruptures between the past, present, continuities that provide stability and meaning to cultures over time. National discourses that make use of collective memory to alter history according to their narrative are skeptical for this very reason when disavowing the images of the past. In a sense, the past recuperates as it is transferred and accepted across generations because presentism assumes that memory and images of the past are produced in the present for present purposes and hence are indices not of anything that happened in the past and its effect on the present, but of the structure of interest and needs of the present. Critical to this understanding is an acute awareness that to conceptualize memory, a perspective complementing the collective existence of a generation is essential to reproduce its identity. Identity, therefore, is uh, is imagined link between a generation, generation's past and memory uh, based upon the supposition that succeeding generations are more likely to generate uh, the dominant narrative and discourse adopted by nations when the issue of the historical veracity is at play. In excommunicating the Martinican history that has repressed the memory of its subjects, the interconnection between Mrs. Past and the narrative of Martinique should be juxtaposed in order to impartially verify the alternate histories. It is here that Bissant's hypothesis extends meaning to the fact that quote-unquote linear progressive view of history is a dangerous longing in the new world. In this manner, the novel rejects a markedly delineated narrative for an overly inverted inscription of memory that crowns the permanence of experience by referring to the longing in the Caribbean for an ideal past which history cannot provide. In a more acute sense, the suddenness of disruption in memory intensifies the reflective processes of the past because, quote unquote, we have a tangle of interrelations that need to be deciphered but we ought not to expect from this a resurrection of the living experience of social agents, as if history were to stop being history and link up again with the phenomenology of collective memory. As is the case, the novel allows memory of the characters to be portrayed as a testimony to the otherwise historical inaccurate transmission of knowledge of the past. The idea that the past exists, even when challenged by the discourses of authority, including those that have arguably left an indelible imprint upon the histories of our times is but a phenomenon. A close reading of the text would introduce the reader to the past actions of history to suggest that, quote unquote, one of the results of current culture process is a widespread anxiety magnifying worries about the future. So as we must contemplate together, this is everywhere translated into a need for futurology. As a result, this search for identity is crowded in the history of slavery that further associates itself with genealogy marked by the quote-unquote violence of filiation. It is therefore not surprising that Misa is least interested in the question and does not want answers to the questions regarding her ancestry. Unlike others, she refuses to accept history of the island as systematic and linear that the Western hierarchical model has to offer as she is wary of another dominating discourse underpinning the history of slavery instead. This reaffirms that widespread herd of memories is what Plissan seeks to inscribe, quote unquote, a praxis of national territorial liberation grounded in the principle of obesity, which recognizes and actively draws on both the density and the diversity of the other. Plissan understands this more than any other Caribbean writer, for he is uh, of the view that the overemphasis on links with periods of French history is a trap created by uh, an assimilationist way of thinking spread to Martinican historians. To that end, the narrative underscores Mises' point of view as it pinpoints the misrepresentation of the past in the context of slavery. 
The novel therefore refutes the claims of a generic view of the past and directs its attention on accentuating history's indifferences. Given the context of the novel, it wouldn't be wrong to say that for Clissand, Canterbury Martinique is a colonized world, the epics and summation of French colonization, a world from which all events have been obliterated. Thank you. Nice presentation, Abhishek. Thank you, sir. Uh, Abhishek, uh, Edward Glissant is a very prominent name in Caribbean literature. And yes, uh, your paper is on his novel, The Overseer's Cabin. Would you tell me in which language uh, this novel was originally written? Yes, sir, it was in French. Okay. Uh, is there anyone who wants to ask a question from Abhishek? It's already 2.25. I think uh, the next technical session is uh, to be begun. And uh, in this technical session, there were only three presentations and one paper presenter couldn't present the paper. Might be going to some technical problem or urgent work. So, I would like to say that all papers were well crafted and in the end I would like to thank the organizers for giving me opportunity to chair this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>